Okay, so just to say thank, initially, thank you very much uh, to Mary and Avril for inviting myself and Claire along today. We're delighted to be here to talk about the work we've been doing over the past kind of probably about three years now in developing a virtual reality disease diagnostics lab. So Claire and I are both at the University of Glasgow. I am in the School of Life Sciences and Claire is in the Institute of Molecular, Cellular and, Biology, um, and Systems Biology. And we're both in the same college of MVLS. So I think most people can say that they recognize virtual reality in terms of gaming. It's been around for a long time now. And one of the benefits about having virtual reality in the world of gaming is, is that it's really big business. So over the years, the cost of this technology has been coming down and has made it more accessible for uh, industries and therefore is being used now as a, a, a tool to teach people to build skills in the workplace. And really over the past kind of five years, it starts to kind of creep into the world of education and has started to show promise as an educational tool, uh, but particularly has been shown to, to be beneficial for skills development and training. So particular fields in education have really already embraced VR technology. Uh, so medicine, education and engineering are examples of that. Uh, but if we look a bit more widely into the workplace, uh, pharmaceutical companies like AstraZeneca are using virtual reality to, to train scientists that will be working in their labs. And they have said that virtual reality labs have been excellent for them. It saves a huge amount of time and money to train scientists before they come into the lab on things like safety uh, and using kit, uh, technology and things like that. They're going to experience moving into a lab in a, in a big pharma industry. So as I said, the cost of VR technology has massively decreased over the years. And I think that's why now um, we are really looking at this a bit more seriously around um, using it as a tool in education. So an example would be a, a really good, decent VR headset now costs about £300, but a few years ago it was a couple of thousand and therefore just not realistic in terms of technology that we could embrace in higher education and education more widely. There is also now the emergence of virtual reality research labs, uh, and they do have a focus on VR and teaching in universities. Uh, we have a research virtual reality research lab currently being built as part of uh, the new development within the University of Glasgow, and that's going to be really key in terms of developing ideas around how we can use virtual reality but also working out the impact of virtual reality teaching to see whether or not it's an effective tool, because actually we don't know the answer to that question yet. Uh, there hasn't been that many publications. The publications that have been out have been with various small numbers uh, and, and different styles of approach to teaching. So there's not really a clear answer on that yet, uh, but we're very interested in, in using virtual reality um, for a number of reasons, and I'm, I'm going to talk a bit about that now. So where did we start and why on this journey? So um, in 2017, the University of Glasgow launched a competition to look for 10 virtual reality lessons. So this was right across the university. And there was an individual, Dr. Neil, Neil McDonnell, uh, who sits in the School of Arts. And he had a background in using virtual reality in a previous job before he came into the university and was very keen to explore the idea of virtual reality in teaching. So he launched this competition and he was asking everybody to think about uh, what lessons that they might want to design and put in, put in bids into this competition. So there was a few of us across MVLS who were keen and interested in this concept. Uh, and there was over the university of 30 applications, 10 were chosen and we luckily were enough to, to win one of those places. So between 2018 and 2020, we start to design a lab to complement a, a molecular methods disease diagnostics lab that we run as part of a third year course called Molecular Methods. And this VR research lab um, really kind of complemented the course that, that we already had in place. And I'll tell you a bit more about the course uh, in the next slide. But why did we feel that this would be a, a beneficial addition to the course that we were already running? So our students, as part of this course, are in labs, but they're also um, asked to do some um, computational data exercises, so data analysis sessions. And the students really did struggle 
linking what lab work that they did, what the data would look like coming out of that, and then analysing that data. And there really was a missing link there. So we thought that this could fill that gap and we could have a VR lab that would really go through all the processes the students would be doing in the lab, but then link it quite nicely to data and the analysis that they do. In addition, students don't get access to a, a research lab environment until their final year, and they don't get to work in environments like laminar flow hoods, which they, they work in in this app. This is due to our huge class size. So we have students, 70 students in a lab at a time, and we just don't have enough space for laminar flow hoods. So it was an opportunity to get them working in a, in a very different environment that they had the opportunity to work in uh, normally. So the course itself, so we had five, we have 500 students taking this course a year. It's a third year course and all life science students take this course. So from genetics students to anatomy students to sports science students. And some of those students have varying backgrounds in molecular subjects, but they also have real difficulty engaging with material like this. So for example, the more human biology type students taking things like anatomy and sports science do struggle with doing a molecular methods course, but we feel it is absolutely essential for their graduate skills to have these experiences in molecular labs, because many opportunities in terms of careers when they graduate will be in those environments. So really, we over a number of years, we are trying to be de developing innovative teaching tools for this course. And um, the VR environment was a, the, the kind of next innovative teaching tool we were thinking about to really try to help with engaging the students, but improving their student experience. So what about the process of designing this, uh, this VR lab? So when we got, um, uh, when, we, we were, when we won the competition, uh, there had to be a proposal to Innovate UK for funding. And Dr. Neil McDonnell led that funding application and he got one million pounds worth of funding to create these 10 VR apps, but also to create a space within the university. And those funds went into paying for all the kits required to have headsets and computers and things like that for students to actually physically work with uh, in the university on site. So we worked with a Glasgow based virtual reality company called Sublime. It's now changed its name to Edify. And um, we worked very closely in collaboration with them to develop this app. We came up with an initial brief and um, the VR lab is actually modelled uh, in, a, in a real lab that's at the University of Glasgow that Claire herself worked in at the Centre for Virus Research. So Claire took uh, the Edify team up to the site and they took loads of pictures of all the different kit that's used and they created a VR version of that. And that's what you can see in this image here. And we're going to, to give you a, a short walkthrough of the lab and, and show you what the actual app looks like. So it was really this kind of iterative process of creation. So we gave them a brief initially, and then they put something together. We would come in, we would uh, go into their Glasgow company, which is in the city centre, uh, and we would go through the app and we'd say, well, that's not quite how that works when you pick up that pipette or that's not really the next step, I actually need to, to add in another step, and so on. And they would then do that, and then we would come back a few months later, and that went on for quite a period of time until really something that we were happy with and they were happy with. Uh, so it came about that in kind of 2019, January time, January, February, they were starting to consider that the apps are ready to go, they're ready to launch, and we can start trialing them with students and we can maybe get some in to do a pilot. But then, of course, the COVID pandemic hit in, uh, in March. So um, they put the brakes on that because clearly you couldn't have students coming on campus to do VR because there's all sorts of issues with, with that. Um, so Edify very quickly moved to developing VR by proxy. And that meant that come 2020, when the teaching started for us in September, October, uh, we could actually do VR from home. So I sat at home with a headset on, linked up to Zoom, and uh, delivered all the lessons via Zoom. So we did that between 2000, for, for the two semesters, 2020 and 2021. 
So really that was that was a very clever way of enabling this technology to immediately be uh, used much more widely than we could have imagined before the pandemic, where really only higher education institutes who had this kind of space and, and could pay for all this technology could access this uh, VR um, these, this VR work. So immediately just becomes a bit more inclusive and uh, you know, has the ability to be a bit more flexible in terms of learning. So what did we do? So we uh, had small groups of students of about 20 students and we had them for about an hour. I went through the VR app with my headset on. They could see what I could see within the VR world. We went through the lesson. That took about 20 to 30 minutes. And then Claire was on Zoom, answered questions that were coming in as I went along. And then the two of us sat with the students for about another half an hour and answered any questions they may have from how the tech works, what they're actually doing in the lab. Because remember, these students hadn't been in the lab at all that year. They had no lab experience from their third year so far. So this was really their first insight into what a molecular lab looks like. It was online via, uh, via VR. So we just allowed them to have a chat and the chat was often very informal and that was great. And we often talk, ends up talking about careers in research and uh, and our own experience in research labs and how that worked because they've only ever been in a teaching lab before. So then moving on from that, uh, October this year, so a few months ago, we were lucky enough to be back on campus. I think we were all celebrating that and students could finally get into the virtual reality lab. So we have a virtual reality lab now set up in the Partick Borough Halls. So these, this is a, a, an off-site centre. It's about a 15 minute walk from the University of Glasgow campus. And I have a, a picture of it. So these were some of our students this year who uh, managed to actually get into the lab and, and start using this technology. So we were absolutely delighted that it could be used. So in a room, we have 15 headsets. So we have uh, computers here. So you can actually, as an instructor, see what the students are doing and where they are. The students are wearing a headset here and they have their controller. The computer sits down here on the floor, but in addition, uh, in the picture here, uh, I hope you can see my cursor moving, but there's a, a, a box sitting on the floor and that's actually a clean box. So the very clever thing about this is that you can, once a student has finished in one of these uh, VR headsets and the controllers, you can pop the equipment into this clean box and within a minute it's cleaned, it's UV technology and it means it's ready to go for the next person. So you don't have to worry about any kind of cross-contamination um, which is is you know essential at the moment so I think it's probably a good time for me to um, show you what this lesson looks like so Claire has put together a four minute video and has um, recorded a, a chat over the top of that just to kind of talk you through what um, what our students actually see when they're in this environment and then Claire is going to present um, the, the last part of the talk so I'll just Move on and let's hope this works. Welcome to the Disease Diagnostics Laboratory. This is a research laboratory that has been modelled on a lab at the University of Glasgow Centre for Virus Research. Today we will be diagnosing two individuals who have presented with the symptoms of a Zika virus infection. The first thing that we are going to ask you to do upon entering the lab is to wash your hands thoroughly and put on a lab coat. We wash our hands before entering the lab to cut down on the risk of potential contamination and wear a lab coat to protect our skin and clothing. Once you have done this, you are ready to enter the lab and start your experiment. We will be using a technique called qPCR or quantitative real-time polymerase chain reaction. This allows us to amplify nucleic acid from part of the virus genome and determine if it is present in the samples taken from the patients. This is a virus research laboratory where a number of experiments can take place. All of the equipment that you will need for today's experiment is here. Look out for the blue boxes that will provide you with instructions along the way. We will now go to the laminar flow hood, which allows us to prepare the samples in a sterile environment. Before starting, you will need to put on gloves and disinfect your workspace. Your first task is to prepare a master mix using the reagents provided. You will find three pipettes that can dispense various volumes, along with the pipette tips, five tubes in a rack containing each component of the master mix, and a beaker of disinfectant. Select the correct pipette for the required volume for each component. 
you may need to adjust the volume of the pipette before you put on the pipette tip. To take up the correct volume, you need to push the plunger on the pipette to the first stop, which is the first pressure point. Pick up each tube and slowly release the plunger to take up the required volume. To dispense it into the preparation mix tube, push the plunger to the second stop to expel all of the liquid. Now you can eject the tip into the disinfectant beaker and repeat the remaining components. Once the master mix is ready, we can prepare our samples for the qPCR machine. This is done in a very similar way to the procedure you just followed. We now have two racks of tubes, the rack on the right hand side containing smaller tubes that will fit into the qPCR machine, and the rack on the left, which contains five tubes moving left to right we have the master mix we made earlier, two cDNA samples that were synthesized from the RNA extracted from blood samples taken from our patients, and a positive and a negative control. We need to generate cDNA from the RNA genome of the virus, as qPCRs only detect DNA and not RNA. As before, you must prepare each qPCR tube containing the required volume of master mix and either patient cDNA or a control sample. Remember to take care with pitting small volumes as this is a very common step that causes error. Once you have completed this, you can secure the caps of the tubes and the tubes can now be removed from the laminar flow hood. Before they can be loaded into the QPCR machine, we must first take the tubes to the centrifuge so that they can be spun down briefly to ensure that any small volume of liquid is incorporated into the mix at the bottom of the tube. Once this is complete, the samples can then be transferred to the qPCR machine. While the machine is running, it is cycling through various temperatures for 40 cycles. At the end of each cycle, the amount of fluorescent signal is recorded, allowing us to quantify the level of DNA amplification, which is a direct relevant link to the amount of RNA in the patient sample. On completion of the reaction, the results of the qPCR are available on the computer. And using qPCR software, we can analyze the fluorescent signal detected. OK, I think that's the last. Here, do you want to take over from here? Yep, thank you, Nicola. Hi everyone, sorry I was in a, a PhD Viva this morning, so it's been a bit of a hectic day so far. Um, but that just gives you a bit of a, a sequence shortened version of the, the VR app and the experiments that the students got to do. So you got to see and got to experience kind of the situations that the students got while Nicola had the headset on and was working through the, the, the VR by proxy. So it was a complete coincidence that we had already started working on this and developing this. So when the COVID pandemic hit and everything was being done from home, this put us in a really optimal place to be able to share some form of experimental lab work with our students, because as Nicola said, nobody was coming onto campus um, and we wouldn't have been able to, to give our students any, any lab work. So although it was developed to be done for students to be on campus and working through it themselves, they were still able to get some level of um, lab work experience by watching Nicola work through the experiments and by, able to, by being able to ask questions on Zoom so that they could get a kind of sense as to what was going on. So we got some really, really good feedback from our students, not just the ones that have done it recently on campus, but also the ones that did it by proxy. So it gave them a kind of shared experience that they were in a teaching lab, they were in a lab working through these experiments and they weren't on their own. There were other students around them that were able to, to do this with them. Most of the students had never done any VR before. So this was a really new experience for them. And we did get a few, oh my word, this is crazy type comments as they entered the VR world, which was really nice. Um, and a lot of the comments that we've had um, both on campus and by proxy were that they would like to get more of this kind of um, experience in their curriculum. At the moment, we're trying to understand 
where it would fit within the curriculum because some students really like that they have done the real life lab first and then they get to do this as a kind of consolidation tool afterwards whereas some students feel it would really help boost their confidence when they actually did get into a lab to be able to do this um, earlier on before they actually went into the lab. Um, something that we didn't really have to worry about when we did it by proxy was that um, VR can be nausea inducing for some students, so it may not be fully accessible. The good thing about our lab is that it isn't a roller coaster or anything where there is too much movement going on. So it does minimize that risk, but some students who have done it on campus have said that they did feel a little bit nauseous and a little bit um, kind of dizzy or disorientated as they were working through, um, through the um, VR lab. However, generally most of the students seem to have really enjoyed it and did think that it was very useful. So we've got some examples of some of the comments that we've had um, and most of them seem to have really enjoyed the experience. Um, Nicola, could you move to the next slide, please? Thank you. So, um, of course, it was a massive coincidence that we were able to do um, the VR by proxy during the COVID pandemic when everybody was working at home. And so we thought we would capitalise on this by doing a scholarship study to try and understand. We appreciate how, how good this is in being able to boost students' confidence and being able to help them work through the processes that lead up to the data analysis section. So the final section that you saw in the video that we just played was the computer screen where they were given um, some coloured lines that they would visualise on a computer screen. The students would never see that normally. All they would get would be the data given to them later on. So it allowed them to see that link between the samples that they put into the machine and the data that they were getting back out. So they wouldn't they wouldn't get the data analysed within the VR world, but they would get an image of that computer screen outside of the VR world so that they could make that connection. So we wanted to understand how useful this was for the students while they were working at home and they didn't have access to, um, to any lab work. So we did this by splitting our students into two groups. So the first group, um, they had the VR incorporated into their normal um, lessons that they were running through. So the molecular methods course runs over five days and the final day, the fifth day is the PPCR day. So they were given this VR incorporated into that day as part of their um, Moodle book that they were working through. And we asked them questionnaires at the start before they started working through their Moodle book. And then again at the end, the second group, they worked through a Moodle book on its own. So this contained quizzes and videos and um, learning science simulations. So it was still quite interactive, but it didn't include the virtual reality aspect. The students were asked to complete the questionnaire at the start and then after they'd worked through the Moodle book. And then later on, we brought them back in and we gave them the VR after they had worked through all the material. So they did get the VR later on and then we then asked them a further questionnaire to get their, their um, feelings on how they felt um, the VR would have, would have been useful for them. Sorry, Claire, just a two minute warning. <laughs> All right, okay, thank you. Um, so basically just to say the students have been overwhelmed while they were working at home. So we didn't get a huge number of responses from the groups, uh, the level three students that we worked with. So we did bring in some level two students and thankfully we managed to get um, some students to participate in focus groups. And that has given us quite a good um, amount of data for us to be able to work with. And we're currently working on this uh, scholarship study at the moment. Nicola, could you move on? Thanks very much. Um, so using the, the virtual reality um, lab as part of our Moodle book to be able to, to give the students some aspects of um, lab life while they were working at home was very coincidental, but very, very valuable. So not only from a teacher's point of view, but also the students um, gave us really positive feedback and said that it really helped them understand the, the, the practical elements that we were trying to teach them through the, the Moodle course. As I've mentioned, we're still working out how we're going to best incorporate this so that we know it's not a gimmick that the students are just enjoying because it's a one off, but it's actually something that's really valuable that they are able to use. Um, and we're working through the, the study to be able to, to evaluate all of the, the information that we've gathered um, and hopefully we can then go on and progress to the next stage, which would be understanding how this is valuable um, for students that are working through it themselves as it was designed and developed to be run. Um, so just to, to thank everybody that's been involved in this, 
Um, there's been a huge number of people that have been involved um, from the actual design of the, the app itself from the University of Glasgow and, and, um, and Avril, who's now at University of West Scotland, um, and also people from Edif Edify and Sublime. They were all looked absolutely terrified coming into an active virology lab, trying not to touch things, but also trying to point things out that they wanted to take pictures of. Um, and Neil and all of the team that have been helping us with the, the scholarship programme as well. Thank you very much. And me and Nicola are very happy to take questions.